Hello, pre-calculus students. Today, we're going to learn how to um, analyze graphs of functions. In our last lesson, we learned what a function is, or I should say we reviewed what a function is. Um, today, we're going to learn to analyze graphs of functions. So, for ah, move my stuff around here. So, some definitions. On page 43 of the current text we're using, you'll find the definition of a domain. My definition is, it's the set of all x values on a graph. So you take any graph, what x values are on that graph, that's your domain. And the range is the set of all the y values on the graph. There's really nothing more difficult than that. Our definition of a function is a relation. And remember, a relation is just a set of points. It's a relation such that for each x on the function, there is exactly one y value. So you'll notice that at this x value, there's only one point on the graph with this x value. There's only one point on the graph with this x value. There's only one point on the graph with this x value. That's why one of the ways we can test if something is a function is we apply the vertical line test because the equation of a vertical line is x equals something. So if I take my vertical line test here, see how rigorously straight that is. I put it like that. That's the graph x equals something. There we go. And if it's only crossing the graph at one point, for every x value, then it is a function. So that's our vertical line test. We can talk about the zeros of a function. Now, what's funny is if we want to be you know, really precise with our um, terminology, functions have zeros. Those are the x values um, where the function value, which is the y value, equals zero. In other words, they're points on the x-axis. But functions have zeros. Um, polynomials have roots. Equations, uh, sometimes we say equations have roots. Equations have uh, solutions. Um, Graphs have uh, x-intercepts. Those are pretty much all kind of the same thing for our purposes. But I do want to let you know that, um, well, you go to college someday and professor so-and-so might get really upset if you talk about the root of a function. Functions don't have roots. Functions have zeros. So a function is called an increasing function. If, let's say you have a point x2, which is bigger than x1, so it's to the right, then the y value for x is x2 is greater than the y value for x1. That's a very cumbersome definition until you look at it on a graph. Here's x1, here's, oh, here's x2. You can see from our definition, x2 is greater than x1. Now, as long as f of x2 is greater than f of x1, so this is the point x1, y1, which y is f of x1. And this is x2, y2, and y is f of x, so that's f of x sub 2. You can see that if x2 is to the right of x1, this the f of um, the point 2 has to be to the right and above the y value for x1. This is an increasing function. And you should be able to generate the graph for a decreasing function. If x2 is greater than x1, so again, x2 is on the right, the y value is below the y value for x1. Now, 
We have some other terminology. For instance, we have relative minima and relative maxima. You can see that this graph is, you know, let's see, this is at least a one, two, three, four, maybe it's an x to the fifth function. It's at least an x to the fifth because it goes five different directions. One, two, three, four, five. Now, if this graph keeps going up indefinitely, you can see it has no maximum value because it goes up forever, and so that would be infinity. But you can see in this neighborhood, this is a maximum. So it's relative maximum. Think of it as a maximum in the neighborhood. And so is this one. This would go down forever. It would have no minimum because it would go off forever to negative infinity. But in this neighborhood, it's a maximum. These points are relative minimums or relative minima for plural. If you want to say maximums and minimums, um, I will not give you beatings. These are Latin terms. So the definition of a relative minimum is if A is somewhere between x1 and x2, if f of A, in other words, the y value at A, is less than or equal to every y value in that interval, then it's a relative minimum. Let's take a look. Here's x1 and x2, you know, randomly chosen. Um, Here's point A, and you can see that, so if we look at the graph, we're only looking at the graph in this neighborhood between X1 and X2. Now, is F of A less than, so the Y value at point A, is that less than or equal to every other Y value on that graph in that interval? The answer is yes. So A is a relative minimum. And if we wanted to talk about a relative maximum, obviously f of a would have to be greater than or equal to all the f of x's in the interval. So that part, that's just getting us started. All righty, let's continue then. So if you want to, uh, Look in your book on page 54. You should have learned this um, a long time ago. The slope is a rate of change of y with respect to x. That's why it's y over x or delta y over delta x or rise over run. That's what we mean when we talk about a slope. But what if the slope is changing? Here we have this um, appears to be a cubic one, two, three directions, so it's at least a cubic. And you can see that the slope of the tangent line at this point, the tangent line would be right about here. That slope is positive, but then you come down here, slope of the line tangent at a point would be negative. And over here, it's positive again. Huh. So how would we find an average rate of change? So if we go from this x value over to here, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up. The slope was changing, it's going up, 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 and then here it's kind of horizontal, and then the slope's going down, and then it's horizontal again, and then it's going up. What is the average rate of change? Well, it turns out that this is the formula we can use. So you think of it as y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. That's just the slope of the line between your two points. So if we, um, I'll have to draw that in a moment. Actually, I'll draw it now. So this is x1 f of x1, and here's x2 f of x2. 
And let's say my graph looks like this cubic. Well, we're saying, you know, what's the um, average rate of change from here to here? Well, all we're really going to do is say, well, the average, because the slope's, you know, positive here, the slope's negative here, it's positive here, and we have an infinite number of slopes of a tangent line because at this point you have a, you know, slope of, you have a tangent line there with its slope, and at this point you have a tangent line there with its slope. And at this point, you have a tangent line there with its slope. What's the average slope? Well, the average is going to be that slope, which is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Oops. And again, change in y over the change in x, which is the slope of the secant line between the two points. The secant line is just a curve that is just a line that goes through a curve at two points. I know you're probably thinking, what other definitions can we come up with? We've already described it. Um, we've done domain and range. We've done um, increasing and decreasing functions. We've come up with our um, average rate of change. We have some other definitions we need to worry about. First one is an even function, and this is very important and will be even more so as the year progresses in pre-calculus. An even function is a function where for every x, f of x is equal to f of negative x. Now, didn't we just replace x with negative x here? You might remember from a previous lesson that that means such a graph will have y-axis symmetry. So what that means is a graph is an even function. So here's a point x, and here's a point f of x. We go the, the same x distance over this direction, so that's negative x. The y value has to be the same. Think in your mind of a graph except a horizontal line, because that would be boring. Think of a graph where this is true. What kind of graph would have that property that would be an even function? How about y equals x squared? For every point over here, you have a mirror image point over here. How about y equals the absolute value of x? For every point over here, you have a mirror image point over here over the y-axis. So um, y equals the absolute value of x is an even function. Um, what else? Um, y equals x squared is an even function. Well, if we have even functions, what other type of function do you think we're gonna have? You probably got it. We have odd functions. An odd function says f of negative x is equal to negative f of x. So in other words, here's x and here's f of x. Here's negative x, and here's f of negative x. Okay, can you see that f of negative x, well, let's rephrase. If this value here, this distance is f of y, can you see that this distance here is the, it's the same distance? You know, if we took the absolute value, it would be distance f of y. Can you see that the y coordinate here is just the opposite of the y coordinate here? So this is x comma f of x. This is negative x. And this value down here is the negative of this value, f of x. So it's negative f of x. This is an odd function. You can see that um, 
You might recall from our previous lesson about um, symmetry about the origin. You can always take, there's always a pair of points that you can connect with a line segment that goes through the origin, if, if that's the case. Odd functions are symmetric about the origin. So the graph of y equals x cubed, for instance, is an odd function. And later on, um, I think not, maybe not until next semester even, we'll learn that the cosine graph, which is a trigonometric function um, in trigonometry, cosine graphs are even, sine functions are odd. All righty. So you might recall the distance formula from a previous lesson, and how can we use the distance formula to tell if lines are um, collinear or not? Well, the distance between these two plus the distance between these two, does it equal the distance between these two, the two farthest apart? If it doesn't, then the points are not collinear. I'd look at these and say, I'd find this distance, this distance, and this distance. Does the sum of the two shorter distances equal the longest distance? If they do, then the three points are collinear. If not, they're gonna form a triangle. And the way I've drawn this one, that might even be a right triangle. So how could I use the distance formula to see if this, these three points form a right triangle? Now the answer is, again, find the three distances, if you give in the points. And take the two smaller ones and see if a squared plus b squared adds up to c squared. And if it does, it's a right triangle. If not, it's not. How can you tell using the distance formula if um, points are collinear, as I already said? You graph them and you say, is this distance plus this distance equal to this distance? The whole thing. If it doesn't, then again, they form a triangle and they are not collinear. So that's all I have for the video today. Um, hope you got great notes out of it. If you didn't, feel free to go back, pause it, write down what you need, because I'm trying to turn you into a genius. And uh, have a great day.